Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I talk about all the stuff that was announced at the Google event that was worth the Smart Tech Today eye, as well as Chrissy Teigen shouting at a giant Google speaker and, you know, some other stuff too. Stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss it. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by FreshBooks, the number one accounting software in the cloud for self-employed professionals and their teams. Make the running of your business easier and more efficient with FreshBooks. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash STT. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, dynamic, and sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I'm Micah Sargent. And I'm Matthew Casanelli. And today we have a jam-packed show. Uh, I'm very excited about all of the smart tech news uh, in in the uh, fabric of the internet that's out there today. Um, you know, honestly, Matthew, one of the things that I was concerned about when we first were talking about doing the show, and I think something that other people have been concerned about uh, to the point that not a whole lot of people have been interested in launching a smart tech show, was that we wouldn't have enough to talk about but hmm. I feel like I've come to realize that this really is the time to do this. Yeah, we keep running out of time to talk about all of the news. Yes. Um, and so I thought that we could kick things off with what I found to be a delightful bit of internet experience. Um, I think I sent this to you, if I remember correctly, or maybe you sent it to me. I don't know. We uh, Do you follow Chrissy Teigen on, on yeah. Twitter? Yeah. Chrissy. Maybe not as religiously as you. <laughs> it's not quite religious for me, but every once in a while I see Chrissy pop up something very funny uh, that I can't help but laugh about or or what have you. And in this case, uh, Chrissy Teigen was talking about um, this Google device. So what is this, like a Google Home Max or something like that yeah. that they have in their kitchen? And so I think it was both Chrissy Teigen and John Legend who did a campaign for Google, um, specifically like about these devices. And so they have this huge Google Home Max dealy bob in their kitchen. It's just basically a nice, loud, uh, good sounding speaker that has the Google Assistant built in. But the tweet goes, did a whole Google campaign and really use this thing every day. Never once was told there was a volume button on the side. (laughs) And... What is happening here is there's, it's like if your kid goes and says, okay, oh goodness, I've already forgot what Google is supposed to be. Um, uh, Okay, um, (laughs) boo-boo, play X children's song. And it is blasting in the kitchen, just loud as can be. And so she's screaming back at the Google Home device, like, turn it down, turn it down, not knowing that there was a volume button on the side. And I feel like this is like the quintessential experience that people point to when they're like, why would I want to have this stuff in my home? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Especially when it's so like overwhelmingly loud and it can't hear you over... (laughs) The volume of the music, but it's like I've got all these microphones and yet you can't hear me. I was in Best Buy and I I think I had seen this but didn't actually see where the buttons are and I couldn't find them at Best Buy either. So I don't blame her. Like the big giant speaker was sitting there and I was like, I can't, I don't know how to turn the volume up or down. So (laughs) I love the idea of sort of having to, it's like one of those secret passageways where you're feeling along the wall to try to find the button that you press. It's like, where does the, um, now I don't have a, I'm going to have to start bringing like the smart speakers, I think to, to sit here. And so I can have them to talk to on the show, but Scooter X in the chat says, do you have a Google home nearby? Matthew? Oh, me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay. The Nest Hub thing. So we will bleep this out. Uh, but tell your Google home to get spooky. Let's see what happens. Get spooky. <laughs> it's going dun, 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 dun. Oh, or the not not like that. Actually, the spookier one. But <laughs> so is that is that it. Phantom of the Opera? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for some reason, that always makes me think of. Um, that always makes me think of the. Yeah, we've got we do have to mic our Google Home. Uh, that always makes me think of, of vampires whenever I hear that song, not the Phantom of the Opera. So, 
Do you want me to try it again with the full audio? I can move my mic over to it. Yeah, let's do it one more time. Let's see what happens okay. here. We're doing it live. We might as well. Hey, get spooky. Is it working? It is. Oh, did it even make a like a, a scary laugh? Ooh, fun. Uh, we'll have to try those with the other smart assistants and see what happens. I'm sure Siri will tell me she has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll make a shortcut for it. Yes, <laughs> you'll make a shortcut and then we'll have it all figured out. And I'm curious what, uh, what the Echo does. So folks out there who are watching this, if you want to ask uh, your Echo to get spooky right now, go ahead and do that and you can let us know in the chat what happens. Um, that's fun and cute. And I do like this sort of uh, holiday stuff that they will sometimes do. I wonder what happens if you say, I'm in love with you to the, <laughs> to the Google assistant around Valentine's day. <laughs> it's knows? probably some cheeky, like, Oh, I wish I could. I, I don't know. They got to be feel... nice to you also. Cause right. that can be the most depressing thing when it's... maybe one of these days like, I already I have will... a date. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm covered. Thanks. Uh, actually <laughs> the Amazon assistant and I are getting together for, for <laughs> dinner on Valentine's day. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, that's Chrissy Teigen. You should check out the links and go check that out. Uh, it's just funny and I've watched it on a repeat whenever I'm feeling down. Uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty good stuff. Now, this is another thing that <laughs> we have uh, that we have uh, sort of I don't know at least me ever since what was it middle school where they came out with that song ring 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 banana phone ding dong ding dong ding dong ding dong banana phone etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and I apologize maybe it's older than that and I don't know I was going to say it's Raffi Micah which was my first ever concert at the Oregon Zoo when I was like six years old. Um, <laughs> so you heard yeah. Banana Phone when you were six? Yeah, it's like uh, he it's like a, he's just like a kid's entertainer and he does like silly songs. And <laughs> oh, my God, six year old Matthew listening to Banana Phone at a zoo in Oregon. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And now now it'll work with my smart technology. OK, so I'm hearing it's from 94. Um, so yeah, <laughs> there is officially a banana phone uh, out there that's, I assume it's it's a Bluetooth uh, device. And so you can pair it with your phone. You could pair it with anything that uh, uses a, a headset. And I don't have it yet. I've been looking for it and uh, trying to see sort of what company has manufactured the banana phone. Um, um, it's by Banana Phone. Wait, so you do know about <laughs> it's it? It's on Amazon, yeah. $40, one day shipping. Man, I should have ordered this yesterday. Yeah, come on. $40, that's a little pricey for a banana phone. <laughs> they have it in, the images have it in like your fruit bowl in your kitchen and you leave the <laughs> banana phone. <laughs> that's kind of a good spot, I guess. But I kind of love that. <laughs> I love the idea of sort of, uh, I I get a call and I'm entertaining guests and then I just pick up this phone from my my bowl of bananas. Well, This is a little weird, but my so my neighbor can kind of see into our kitchen and I just imagine him seeing in and we're talking on the banana phone. It's like a pick up the banana answer. It's like, what the heck's going on? Uh, we close our shades at, at night and stuff when they can actually see it. But. I guess, you know, if I get, if I get a bonus at Christmas this year, I'm going to have to get the banana phone. It's a little <laughs> too outside of the price point for me to just buy, but it's, yeah. and then while I'm at it, I can go ahead and pick up the banana hub, uh, USB hub and the, <laughs> the banana phone stand that are also being recommended, uh, as options. Oh boy. That's also fun. But, <laughs> um, you know, among the, the smart tech stuff, uh, it's not all that practical. It's just a goofy thing. I, I suppose it falls into the uh, smart teddy dancing twerking bear category <laughs> where it's not something that we necessarily need, but it's fun to have. Um, however, there was something that came up on the news, and this was something that I believe I sent over to you uh, just this week. And it, it's pretty brand new, the news about it, of course. TechCrunch covers a lot of startups. And uh, along with that, obviously involves, oh, this company got a new round of funding and this company got a new round of funding. And so Shine Bathroom, which is currently uh, 
working, I think it's a Kickstarter right now or one of the Indiegogo, um, is this little assistant that is made for your toilet. And it makes you like when I heard, oh, make your toilet smart. My first thought was, oh, brother, obviously. <laughs> Why? We don't need this. This is this is foolish. But as I started to read about it, I kind of got interested in it. So yeah. did you did you get a chance to sort of uh, pick up what this is about? Do you want to tell the listeners about it? Yeah, it's got a couple of different features. Um, I think one of the interesting ones that's actually like directly relevant to me was the um, if your toilet's draining or like... Um, uh, I'm, I'm losing the word leaking? for it right now. Yeah, leaking. Um, it'll it'll detect that through little tiny vibrations and can automatically order a repair kit for you, which is cool because we actually had this in our toilet. We have like a really old toilet, and so it had a weird. I bought like multiple different kits that didn't actually fit with it, but it's like uh, one of our water bills was like three times as high as normal because we let it go for Whoa. like a couple of weeks, not realizing how bad it was going to be. And then it was like, it does leak like hundreds of gallons a day or, or like a hundred gallons a day or something like that. So Holy moly. Like that makes all the difference. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had this and it would have paid for itself basically, I guess. That's true. So that's the thing that, that kind of made me excited about it. It's got an accelerometer um, that you mm -hmm. connect oh, to yeah. the feed for the, the water and into the toilet. And by using the accelerometer, it can detect the, detect the vibrations and then let you know. Because people don't necessarily from the get-go know that that's going on, that you've got uh, a leak or something like that. And then the way that you find out is by getting that huge water bill. And so for me, that in and of itself is pretty cool. But apparently the way that they have this set up right now, which I don't know how this is um, sustainable in the long run, but they send you a free kit for... Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, they, they send you a free kit for uh, for fixing your toilet. And that's something that I think with these uh, VC funding options that are coming along, I think that's <laughs> yeah. going to change pretty quick. Um, but... This is the fascinating, other than that, I think that is a, that's a fantastic thing that sold me on it. Uh, but the other thing that's fascinating about it is that it uses science, uh, mm -hmm. specifically, uh, I, I guess we would call it chemistry, would be chemistry and physics to clean your toilet. So instead of you using one of those like in bowl toilet cleaner things or using a toilet brush regularly or anything like that, um, what this does is it turns your water, it, it, it has like a little container that you fill up with water, which that's one of the flaws, I think. I think that it should be, it should come with a little kit to connect to the water flow and then go yeah. into it so it can refill itself. But you fill the little container with water and it feeds it through this filter that electrolyzes it. So it has like a little current that passes through the water and that electrolyzed water goes into your toilet bowl and does a really good job of not only cleaning, but deodorizing your toilet and will, it, it serves like it's an antibacterial process basically. Um, but it can do that more often because it's not having to rely on, you know, the chemicals and things like that. So it's an all natural mm -hmm. process. And then afterward, uh, apparently the water converts into saline so it's just some water with some salt in it whenever the electrolyzing process has ended and it sort of loses that current, then it will uh, just turn into saline and be flushed. And so it's better for the environment in that way. It keeps mm, your toilet, sense. toilet cleaner longer. Um, and then they have a an update that lets you, I could be anywhere in my house and say, uh, hey, Alpha, clean my toilet. And then this little bad boy kicks on. It's called Shine. Shine kicks on and starts to wash my toilet for me. So, yeah, there are places for me where I feel like we don't need to make a thing smart. But yeah. this is one of those examples where at first blush, I'm like, no, we don't need a smart toilet. And then after I see this, I'm like, well, maybe I do need a smart toilet. Yeah, it's in the like... So it, in case people didn't realize, it doesn't use any soap at all. It's just electric water. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Electric water was actually the name of my ska band in high school. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's pretty interesting. It does seem like, I mean, just to like never clean the bathrooms again. I mean, not that. Okay. <laughs> it sprays your entire bathroom. You just yeah, shut just the door. It, down. it just completely. 
completely soaks it. And in fact, as a prank on April Fool's Day, uh, if you have a guest over to your house or you live with a partner or something like that, when they get out of the shower, you can say, hey, Alpha, go ahead and clean my bathroom and it'll spray the entire room <laughs> with electric water. No, wish, we're kidding. Um, but that would, I mean, as you were saying that, it's like when you have a guest over, that would make sense. It's like, hey, clean the toilet real quick. Might as well. Yes. Oh, my Just God. They're coming through the courtesy. front door and you're like, oh, I better clean the toilet. <laughs> or you have like a routine or something. It's like every time you get home. I don't know that. Much. I mean, oh. I guess if it is sailing, it doesn't really matter as much. But yeah, if I've got the only thing is refilling it, which again, listen, shine, I'm telling you, get a tube that I can attach to my water supply so yeah, that I can that just automatically fill it because that way I would use this. Yeah, I would maybe even set up like a um, a uh, put a door sensor on your bathroom and it's every time it opens mm -hmm. and closes, go ahead and clean my toilet. And then that way it knows that I've you know, use the restroom. <laughs> uh, now, there are some concerns uh, about, you know, a, a strong salt water can be corrosive, uh, but it's my understanding mm -hmm. that this is very low sodium content, which is why they're very uh, quick to call it saline. Um, it's not it's not a super salty solution that's going to end up hurting super salty solution. The three S's uh, that's going to hurt the enamel or whatever of your, of your toilet. Is that what it is? Yeah. Is it enamel? Is it, I don't um, know. I think somebody was just talking about this cause they were saying like people thought ceramic was the same thing with your Apple watch, but it's uh, porcelain. That's right. Porcelain. Yes. Did you know if you cool down porcelain to a very, very, very cold level, it becomes a superconductor. Well, that might be wrong. So. Maybe it's ceramic that does that. <laughs> Don't quote me. I'm not a physicist. I just want a smart toilet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's porcelain, but I'm not positive. So let's just forget that. <laughs> I thought when you first linked me to this, I thought it was going to be like a smart bidet or something. And I was like, oh, I, I know. want, I want <laughs> that. I want, uh, there's a, there's a company called Toto that does a, a bidet. Um, and in fact, so the, this company, they were inspired by uh, some of the bidets that they saw in other countries. And they were like, yeah. look at what these people are doing with these smart toilets. This is something we should have too. Um, and I think that that is, is, I don't know. I like, I, I get, I get where that comes from uh, mm -hmm. to want to do that. And I like that this was, it is only a hundred bucks, which was, this is the type of product that it's like, if it, if it even started to get up to like 129 or something, you might be like, eh, like it starts to outweigh the benefits, just the cost of it. But it seems pretty interesting. Yeah. Now I do want to follow up some, some live breaking news. Um, it's the, it's the, is a square a rectangle? Is a rectangle a square? A square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Porcelain is a subtype of ceramic. And ah. ceramic, when super cooled, becomes a superconductor. <clears throat> so, therefore, porcelain, when super cooled, also becomes a superconductor. <laughs> I just nice. had to make sure so I didn't get <laughs> all those emails about it. Um, yeah, so that kind of... we. I, I like being able to talk about some of this fun and silly stuff and how sometimes it's fun and it's actually worthwhile. And sometimes it's fun because it's fun to make fun of, like a smart hairbrush, which to this day, no one has convinced me is worth anyone's time. <laughs> I, I, yeah. like, why? I still, I don't know. Uh, but I would like to put out the call to you folks out there who are listening to the show. If you see any smart tech stuff come across your feeds or whatever, and you want to submit it to the fun stuff section of our show, uh, send that in to stt at twit.tv. And we will include, well, we'll include some of those in the, the fun stuff section and we'll give you a little shout out too. Um, so if you come across any funny, fun, silly, or potentially even foolish uh, things that you see out there, send those links to us, stt at twit.tv. Um, or you can tweet mm -hmm. at Matthew or me as well. And, uh, yeah. we'll try to include those in the fun stuff section. So is the slight immaturity of a, uh, bathroom device, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> Le bathroom. Um, all right. It's time to talk about a big event that's taken place. I would say that overall, um, the large conversation surrounding the Google event has been um, the the Pixel 
new the new Pixel yeah. 4 device, and with the new Pixel 4 device, it is um, the battery life that people are mm -hmm. kind of complaining right now about the battery life. The smaller one doesn't get great battery life. The bigger one uh, is apparently okay, but that's kind of been a bummer for people. Um, and a little bit of conversation about the microphones, but or not the microphones, the cameras rather. Yeah. I've got microphones on the brain, <laughs> although I have not let Amazon install microphones on my brain yet. <laughs> not yet. So We're in, it's in beta. It's a, yeah, exactly. It's in beta. And I just, you know, uh, they, they called me for the alpha and it was like, no, no brain surgery for alpha beta. <laughs> still not good. Uh, maybe Omega. I'll be there. I'll be ready for you. <laughs> uh, but I, you thought that we should talk about the Google event. And I think it's a great idea because there are some really fascinating smart tech things involved with the, the Google event. So go ahead and uh, kick things off with sure. uh, your interesting choices. I feel like one of the, at least just starting with the Pixel, because that was the, like the main phone device. I think in general, we're not going to talk too much about phones specifically on this show, but Correct, um, yeah. the Pixel has a cool feature called Radar, which is or no, it's is it called Soli? Is the Soli is like the technology radar. behind it? Yeah, yeah. But radar um, but itself, it, I think it's called it's motion branded sense. motion sense. Yeah. yeah, but um, so there's like a it's like a very miniaturized radar chip in the phone that looks out and can detect when your hand is waving in front of it or not. <clears throat> so they're using this as like a navigation system. Mm -hmm. Um, I've I've actually seen a good tweet that went around that was talking about what Google promised versus what they actually gave us because the demo video, we were talking about this actually on um, clockwise podcast earlier this week, but the demo video is very impressive. And I think it was one of those things that to me at first does look like a gimmick. And from what I've seen from reviewers, it might be right now a little bit, but the promise of the technology was really cool where you could basically slide your thumb from like your pointer finger tip up to your knuckle and your phone could detect that really minute motion mm -hmm. and then be like, Oh, you're swiping to the right, like swipe to the right or like turn up the volume or something like that. Um, it was very, it was, it is like I, at the beginning I was like, Oh, this seems dumb. And then by the end I was like sitting in front of my iPad and like twisting my hand and being like, Oh, <laughs> like I could totally like, I could totally use this if it, if it was fully integrated and in everything. Um, so that is super interesting, but like a lot of the demos have people holding their phone and they wave their hand in front of it and then it like half catches it and then goes back and doesn't really fully get yeah. the gesture. So maybe they need a little tweaking there or, I mean, I'm sure there's some user error too, but that's kind of been the biggest um, bummer for me with, with the, <clears throat> with the radar stuff is seeing sort of how picky it is um yeah and it, you know it's early tech obviously and i can only see it getting better uh with time which makes me excited because i think this is fascinating and in fact on um uh on this week in tech they were talking about the solely radar technology that's in this and right now while we have motion sense it is this this tool where it's working from the front of the device but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's being artificially mm -hmm. limited right now to just work with, you know, the front of the device. And it may very well be that they're also using some of the tracking with the the web cam or the, the camera that's built into it. But in theory, you could have mm -hmm. your device on any, going any way. And so I could see my phone's in my pocket. I'm walking and I'm listening to music and I want to go to the next song. I take my hand and I put it beside my pocket and I swipe forward and then it could go to the next song or swipe backward. Yeah. It could go back That's because cool. it's radar. It's not, it's not using the visual um, aspect and it makes sense that it's, it's sort of uh, technologically limited, right. Or, or electronically limited right now by the company because they need to get those gestures down. They need to make sure that it's going to work. And so one axis of control is, is all that can be handled right now. But thinking about the future of this, oh man, this, yeah. that's, it's got me really excited because I want, I want that everywhere. I want my, my laptop the webcam to be able to have this technology built in where I'm talking and doing these things out and about, and I can just like 
tur- you know, somebody comes up to me and I have music playing from my uh, Mac into my headphones and I just put my hand out and I run my thumb from my uh, forefinger hmm. knuckle to like the first knuckle to the second knuckle and it turns down the volume. That's so cool. Yeah. Ugh. That's exactly my experience. It was like going from like the cynical version to like, just like, ah, like technology the possibilities. Is kind of, especially because it is just like radar. I think that's one thing that's, people know what that is. And so it's not some weird, weird thing. That but is a really is good actually, point. That it's, it's also limited in India because of it, because it uses, they're not releasing the pixel at all because it, um, because of the uses radar. like a, yeah, because it uses a government wavelength <sighs> of like spectrum that's not specifically in India is like reserved for the stuff that they do. And so it's like, no, no, the entire Indian population won't get it at all. Wow. Like, which is a huge market. Um, That's wild. But, Did you know? Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't think about that. It reminds me, and I can't remember who I was talking to that told me this, but I didn't know this, that um, in some countries, uh, cell phones are required to have the camera shutter sound on. There's no way oh, to turn yeah. it off. And so even if you have it on mute or you have it on do not disturb or whatever, it still will play the camera shutter sound because it's a, it's a state requirement or a, a government, you know, a federal requirement. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that and found that very fascinating. And so I see this, you know, this is another place. I'm curious then um, what frequency this is running on and yeah. where UWB fits in. Uh, ultra I wide band. Yeah, that's what I thought. It, I think it's still ultra wide band is like 500 or so. I don't remember exactly, but it's it's still a different one. Um, but this is not as wide. I think that's because it was. I think that's stuff like this does always freak people out that it's like shooting signals out at you or something like that. Um, yeah. See, <laughs> that's so frustrating. That. I can't remember, I I say this a lot, I can't remember who I was talking to. Um, And in this case, I can remember who I was talking to. I'm lying to you all. And that's because I want to give this person some uh, protection from what I'm about to say, (laughs) which is that they said to me in, in sincerity you know, you really wonder what all this technology is, is doing to our health, all these, uh, these waves that are being sent out. And I, I understand that fear. I get that concern, but (laughs) scientifically we have shown that that's not something that we have to be concerned about. And that has been something that's scientifically been okayed for ages. Like before we were around, we knew that these, these broadcast waves were okay and that they weren't, I don't know, boiling the the water in our individual cells or something like that, or turning us into plants or something. And so it's really... That's what they want you to think. You're right. Oh my God, where's my foil hat? I don't want to be a ficus. Um, I don't want to be a ficus would be the name of this episode if we did funny titles. But uh, I just, that's that kind of, that still to this day bums me out because I understand, and I want to hear your take on this. Like I get why... There is some hesitant hesitancy to to adopt new kinds of technology, and this idea that tech is inevitable is utter hogwash. A lot of tech is not hmm. inevitable. We choose to make it inevitable by saying it's inevitable. However, as a person who's enthused about technology in general, and as someone who digs in and studies these things, I would rather have a conversation with someone from a place of, I don't know, reality than <laughs> from a place that's not. And you know what? I know they're, they're everybody who has to, to talk about anything wishes that they could have conversations with people in a place of reality. But that bums me out. And so I'm curious, how often do you, um, as a person who's done a lot of uh, uh, sort of support things and, and consultancy things, yeah, do you often run into those issues of like, whoa, I thought we were meeting each other on a level playing field here and I was just helping you set up your tech, but no, no, we have to kick it back to like, no, this phone in your pocket is not ruining your chances of fertility. Yeah, I don't think I've had the um, hardware side as much, but the like software is ruining your brain part, I think is definitely something that people are conscious of and like not overusing their technology or just like the social media being 
hyper connected at all times type of thing. But no, I mean, I don't, I don't see a lot of like, oh, this is going to give me cancer. But I do, I always do like, I don't know. It's, it's still one of those things that I think people, there's some tech, I mean, something like Qi charging where it does like actually heat up and could catch on fire is always there. And I think, um, it's like the tech is built within the acceptable ranges of that stuff, Mm -hmm. but there's, it's possible to build stuff outside of that range that messes with your brain through the audio waves or like the, what are the, um, isn't there, I mean, I don't know if this is even a real thing, but wasn't there some sort of like suspected audio attack on like some government in the past where they like made like all, all the um, people in the embassy like started like throwing up and stuff like that because it was like Ooh. said that they were shooting sound waves. Like I do know that that tech is a thing. Um, well, yeah, if you play um, they're not gonna, Rick like, Astley's never going to give you up <laughs> enough over and over again, eventually you're probably going to vomit. Um, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. I'm looking this up now. The U.S. Embassy in in Cuba. Um, yeah, so exactly. I mean, it might a be a sonic attack. Well, I've heard. I mean, there are sounds that can get you right in your in your uh, eardrum that I hear. You know, not from from an embassy uh, like a, a specific attack. So I totally believe that that is a, a real thing. Um, in fact, <laughs> scientist says there's no proof. Oh, oh. well, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those like things that's probably not realistic, but it's still like, I don't want to completely not care about it. It's like, as long as they're doing the right stuff and it's FCC certified, like don't buy parts yourself and throw it together or something without right. knowing what you're doing. I guess I'll say to that, you know, there are times when um, the sound what is it called? The active noise cancellation stuff can make me feel a little woozy. Mm. Uh, and so if a sound can make you feel dizzy or, or something like that, then I get that. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to coil wine and things like that. Um, you'll remember that we did have that one iPhone not too terribly long ago that when it was uh, running, uh, Stephen Hackett and I yeah, had a conversation say. about that um, that morning and he then went on to publish a, a piece about it and then it blew up and took off. Um, and it was that, you know, every time the the processor sort of spun up, you could hear these like high frequency sounds coming from within the phone. The, the sound is coming from within the phone. <laughs> and that was at, like, that was at the perfect frequency to be kind of a bother to me. So, um, hmm. I don't, I don't remember how we quite got on this topic. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I threw it off by saying people are scared of radar, basically. Yeah, oh, right, 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 right. So I get that. <laughs> I, I understand that fear. But it sounds like in India, it's, you know, at least less about the fear and more about, well, the government's using it, so you don't want yeah. to mess up what the government has, which is understandable. But it is a bummer then that, you know, Google is boxed out with their new devices there. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Huh. I'm, yeah. I'm, hmm, I'm kind of... Uh, did they not think of that or did they just decide to go ahead and didn't matter that know. they didn't have the, Oh boy, that's weird. That's the strategy thing, I guess. But I, some, I mean, some of the other interesting stuff about the pixel phone, I think the most unique kind of voice first thing that they have is the new recorder app, which does the speak speech recognition in real time. And, um, you can like transcribe your meetings as you're having them. And then, it, the cool part is that it works offline. Yes, I love that, this. Yeah, I've been, I like want Siri offline for sure. Just in general, I think everything should be as offline as it can be mm-hmm. and then hook into the web when it needs to versus sending everything over the air just because it's easier or something like that. Um, but these are, these are impressive because I mean, Google has always crushed it with real time dictation and like, uh, Google Docs and stuff like that and in their just voice assistant stuff in like Google Maps and now this is just like another step further. Yeah, um, I agree. And <clears throat> I found this fascinating. The Google event was being compared to Amazon's event in terms of how many products were announced. And 
Google announced far fewer products. And the conversation there was kind of like, why are they only announcing so few versus Amazon, which is just like, you, we heard you like the Echo, so we put the Echo in every possible <laughs> thing we possibly could. I'm so dog. I'm yo dog, right? I'm surprised there's not an Echo Jack O' Lantern, and now that might be a project I have yeah, to I work on. Yeah, it probably exists, huh? Um, but Google was saying we are looking at three key places. We want to solve the problems when people are at home, when they're working at the office, and when they're traveling around the world. And as long as we can solve those problems, we don't really need to worry about any of the other other places uh, or or tech. And speaking specifically to this um, offline transcription thing. This is excellent in so many ways. And it, it, it falls within that, uh, whether you are, are, you know, at home and you, uh, from an accessibility point of view, maybe you need to be able to communicate with someone who has low or no hearing and to have those transcription features available is really nice at work where you're in a meeting and you are the person who takes the minutes for the meeting or something like that to have this here as a backup or even as like a first go and you know you, you write your minutes from that is really awesome and when you are traveling i don't know i guess you're transcribing the alphabet game that you and your family are playing in the car huh. uh but no i like for conferences and things like that i could see it being really handy um it doesn't do to have. translation does it or do they've already they, they have the translation them. app in real time that's always amazing yeah but bring those together that's when that's when you've really i was gonna say happening. maybe i mean even though it doesn't have the greatest battery life the um they're they have like a cool new super zoom thing that uses the ai to let you zoom in from like extremely far away so maybe the pixel could be good as like a literal camera for traveling and oh. a transcription thing. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. A great travel phone in general. <laughs> home uh, phone, travel phone. Home, <laughs> yeah, I've got my, my home phone is an iPhone. My travel phone is the Pixel 4 Max. I don't, what do they call the big one? Do we know? I think it's XL. Okay, um, the Pixel 4 XL. Um, I, th I thought it was interesting that they said the focus on the work environment because I don't, See, I mean, I guess Google Docs is the main. You're just zone, salty but, because your G Suite account won't work with the Google uh, Assistant. Yeah, well, the G Suite account, you can't even be signed in to a G Suite account on a Pixel at all. Like, it's not allowed. And I was like, what? So you can transcribe meetings as long as it's not at all associated with... It was very... Yeah, it's like even more limited than... Normal Google Assistant. Yeah. It's, okay, so I'm, no I'm one like, can see this, but I'm making a face <laughs> yeah, exactly. of just utter confusion and bafflement. Uh, I, don't I, I don't know what to say. Did they say why? What's what? I think it's the same thing where it's the privacy and like check it scans all of your data. So as long as you, if you are signed in, then it kind of has to do that. It's a little, I, I saw like, Joanna Stern tweeting with John Gruber about this this morning. I was like, this is very weird that at all. I, I mean, he still that's, did, a, that's such I'm a, like blown away that more people <laughs> haven't mentioned this in the last like three years because this is like a, what is, the, I don't know the saying, but it involves a scalpel and like a, a, a hammerhead shark. No, it's a scalpel and a big old <laughs> sledgehammer. And they've done the sledgehammer solution to the privacy concern instead of doing the scalpel solution, which <laughs> would allow you to log in with your G Suite account like you should be able to. That makes no sense to me. I don't understand. Well, there's other privacy concerns too, but let's cover the other stuff before we move on to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> classic. But, yeah, that, uh, was, uh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> um, I would say... The two other, I mean, I guess one quick thing that they kind of snuck in is that the Daydream service that they had for, it was a augmented reality or virtual reality headset mm -hmm. for that you stick your phone in. They pretty much are like ending that, it seems like. I do think that this was sort of a stopover in between where you could get cheaper headsets that are good enough fidelity. But like, I think most people didn't really put their phone into a VR thing and look at your phone screen super close. So it is a little weird that their stuff is dead. Yeah, that I mean, 
I, maybe it's weird, but I don't think it's weird because Google kills yeah. things all the time. <laughs> they are the always killing things. The service really cool when it first came out. Yeah, I agree. But it I was agree. like even the same. I got. I have the. Um, I don't even remember what the Facebook standalone one is. That's not the full um, headset. It's like the uh, Facebook has their own. Yeah, or because they own Oculus. But, oh, um, oh, 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 yeah, I have that as well. Oculus um, Go? Yes, I believe. But um, it, like, every, once I got in, I was, like, excited to use a couple of the apps that I had seen, and it just didn't have the capabilities. Like, these were pretty limited demo things. So yeah. It yeah. is just interesting, though, that it's, like, seems like smartphone VR is not going to be a thing anymore. Yeah, I've got my Oculus Go just sitting at my house, not being it's mm-hmm. still it's still in the box. I didn't reopen it. Um, I figure it will be a nice. I don't know if this is relevant, but like a second headset. So if you're using like a Quest, somebody else could use that type of thing. But yeah, maybe. I don't even. That's like. But then the, <laughs> everyone's fighting. Yeah, yeah, everyone's fighting over the, the quest, like to get the quest. I want to use the, the quest this time. Hmm. Uh, we have a lot more to talk about, but before we do yeah. that, I do want to tell everybody uh, about our pals at FreshBooks, who are once again bringing you this episode of Smart Tech Today. See, FreshBooks takes the stress out of accounting for you and your business with easy-to-use billing, expense organization, and time tracking. And guess what? It's all at your fingertips. If you're self-employed, if you're stuck in the old days of manual invoicing, well, you got to stop wasting time. See, using this service, your billable hours and expenses are automatically added to invoices. Easy invoicing means more time to grow your clients list, serve them better, and share in their success. If you have a team that you need to keep on track, well, collaborate with your team on one platform and utilize specific team members by assigning them to the manager role. This is a cool feature. So instead of having team members who sort of had to come to you for everything, if you assign specific team members to the manager role, well, then your second in command can manage projects, billing, and other team members more effectively in a single tool, letting you get the work done that only you can do. If you're always on the go, well, FreshBooks has you covered there too. You can download their easy-to-use app today and always have your business with you. It's easy to snap a picture of the receipt so that you can get your expenses dropped in. You can respond to clients from wherever you are, and you never miss an update. FreshBooks lets you stay in sync across the desktop and the mobile app so you can work on whichever devices you prefer without missing any important information. And Matthew Casanelli, I know you've talked before uh, that you are a FreshBooks user, and you've sort of always been on the the, the premium track there. You didn't even fool around with the other mm. stuff. You went straight <laughs> to FreshBooks. Yep, and it's almost that time of the end of the month, so oh, gotta time. get gotta get in there. Time <laughs> to start uh, getting that getting that dough from the clients. Uh, FreshBooks <laughs> is used and trusted by small business owners in over 120 countries, including right here in the United States by Matthew. With customer service via phone, email, and live chat, you're able to get a quick response to your questions. Hey, make the running of your business easier and more efficient with FreshBooks. You can visit freshbooks.com slash STT and enter Smart Tech Today in the How Did You Hear About Us section to receive 30 days free. Once again, that's freshbooks.com slash STT and enter Smart Tech Today to receive 30 days free. And folks, if you're out there listening, you should definitely head to that URL, freshbooks.com slash STT, because FreshBooks was awesome. They heard we were launching a show and they said, you know what? We want to be a part of the get-go. We want to we help you kick this thing off. And so by going to that URL and checking out FreshBooks, you're not only going to be getting an awesome service, but you will also be letting them know that they made the right decision to help us kick this show into high gear. Thank you, FreshBooks. All right, Nest Mini. We've got we've got a, a Echo Dot style device from Google that well, and I guess we've had these before, right? These the the yeah. sort of different options, but now it's got the Nest name. Yeah, attached. that's a big thing. Is I think this actually happened at their event earlier this year, but they were like, we're going to drop Google Home as a thing, and now they are finally wrapping it all under the Nest brand. Um, and there is actually some like downstream implications of that. But in general, if you are looking for, it's called the Google Home or <laughs> See? Yeah. Google Nest Mini, the um, Nest Wi-Fi, the Google Home Hub is now the Nest Home Hub and stuff like that. Oof. So 
good to know. Um, and like Nest cameras, all the original stuff too that Nest always did. Um, but the the main thing for the Mini is it's now supposedly sounds good because <laughs> that was my main complaint was that it it sounds very like I think it almost only had like highs that would come through. So like the oh. mids and the lows were pretty bad. Um, it, I mean, they were like giving them away like candy. So they really were. Yeah. That's you want a free Nest Halloween. Mini? How about three? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think the main thing now is it's yeah so it should sound like I'd say passable and then um, it has like a little hook on the bottom so you can mount it on the wall which is kind of nice because a lot of times you have to find some specific spot for these and also um, the Nest Mini there it is um, has an upward facing speaker so if you set it on a tabletop it'll shoot into the air but if it's on the wall it'll come out at you which is kind of nice oh that is nice okay so improved audio and more places you can put it I, mm -hmm. so uh, I, yeah I guess it's not enough of an art piece I think for me to want to hang it from yeah. my wall that's a little odd perhaps it'll look like <laughs> a wall wart but I get the sentiment there because it's in a better place to hear you potentially. And uh, if you are using it as a, a, a smart music speaker device, then having that sort of at ear level when you're moving around in the home is kind of nice. But I don't, yeah. I don't know. Uh, that I think it's just kind of rounding out the bass end, like especially with the Echo Dot being updated now. I think a lot of these are just like, they were okay before and now it's probably like pretty decent. And I think the thing that I'm just sort of like grumbly about is that people have to now replace these. And that's something that I always valued about that the home pod was like, I don't think I'm going to have to upgrade and I might get more over time, but I don't think it's going to get any worse. Obviously you're paying up front for that type of thing, right. but it is, it's like, now people are going to have really old echoes for ages and i'm i have one I like still i don't have know a first if gen I echo too it. yeah so it's like yeah it's i w i wish they had started out at a higher quality from the beginning so that people there's just going to be like landfills full of old echoes oh, and home man. minis and stuff like that yeah i mean maybe they should work on better recycling programs too yeah, that would be nice. That's a whole nother. <laughs> I'm going to have to launch a this week in green <laughs> thinking thing just to like <laughs> balance out the guilt I feel about all these different shows I do where we're like consumerism. Um, well, you were you were talking about the art aspect of it and the uh, Nest Wi-Fi is a whole other thing that this is Google's new. It's sort of a home pod competitor, but not. It's a wait. The Wi-Fi has speakers in it. Yeah, I don't know how good the speakers are. I don't think they're going like for HomePod level, but it's they I was watching the event and a lot of people did kind of criticize Google for just the the feel of the event was a little bit weird. Like there was just like really long segments about stuff that wasn't super like they talked about the controller for like the first 25 minutes and then <laughs> the the Pixel book they were like here it is. Okay, moving on. Um so it was sort of odd, but this one specifically, they were like, whenever we talk to people, they all have their Wi-Fi in a closet and it like reduces the quality. And so my brain was like, okay, cool. They found some sort of Wi-Fi that goes through the wall so it can work even better. And they were like, instead, we made a product that you have to put out on your table. And it's like a big white orb that you plug your Ethernet in and then your, your Wi-Fi and your smart speaker are kind of one. But... Even shape-wise, it's like a, if somebody took the HomePod and just pushed down the top <laughs> and then it's squeezed out on the sides. Oh, into like, like, a, like a s'more marshmallow. They, they yeah, held exactly. a HomePod over the fire for a little bit and then yeah. smushed and it down then, with a graham cracker. Exactly. It, I don't think it looks very good. Like dimensions like that do matter. And something like the HomePod for me disappears into my setup. And mm. this seems like it. they want it to be like a centerpiece and... I was like, you just contradicted yourself 10 seconds ago when you said that people don't like to put them out. And then it's like, this one you have to put out. So I thought that was interesting. But I get the idea of wanting to, to design something beautiful enough or I guess unobtrusive enough that p folks feel like it's worth putting out. Yeah. But I don't know. I need it to, what they really, what I really need them to do is sort of create a uh, signal 
uh, invisible. There's a, there's a real name for that, but it's not coming to my mind right now. So folks just bear with me. Wi-Fi invisible, meaning that the signal can pass through, uh, and someone will tweet at me to let me know what I'm supposed to be saying here. Uh, like a, a side table or, or chair or something. And so the, well, maybe not chair that gets a little weird if you're sitting on your Wi-Fi, but we'll go with side table or a lamp or something. And then I'm going to have it out. It serves all these different purposes and it's not just this weird blob that I have sitting. I'm not going to make this home thing my centerpiece of my counter, of um, of my coffee table, of any of that. That's not, I, I'm not keen on that. So I need something that serves multiple purposes. Don't make me take up space, take up more space with your technology. Uh, because if you are going to do that, then I'm going to shuffle it away to a specific room, which my router, my, my Wi-Fi router is in my office. And then the beacons are in different places around my house, but those just plug into the wall. So they're out of the way. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this I I like the idea uh what they're saying of like people like to tuck them away. It's true. And so what you should be doing then is making something that people won't want to tuck away and I don't think that a big blob is that thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's I do like the concept of merging the base station with your smart speaker so that you don't just have like both for no reason, but I think then it also becomes like do you want to get your Wi-Fi through the same, like, is that the same quality as your speaker? It does kind of make a double choice that, I I don't know, it's sort of interesting. I mean, Google was taking a lot of shots in general at this event. Like, one of the big things they said was, nobody actually wants an ultra-wide camera, and it was like, because the Google has the Zoom, and a lot of people were like, uh... Maybe you're just saying that because you don't have an ultra-wide camera and everybody seems to be freaking out about that right now. So. Yeah, that's kind of a bummer <laughs> because, yeah, I've seen a lot of conversation about that and the um, the other, the, the the battery life. Those two things kind of seem to be the big ones that people are, are pointing to. Now, mm-hmm. they say it's inspired by ceramic objects, so it's supposed to look like a pot sitting on your on your <laughs> desk or your, I your didn't counter that. table. Well, um I like that it has a little light that comes out of the bottom of it. It th- yeah. There's a little bit of functionality, but it seems like the light is not very bright. What I will say is pricing wise, you can get a router and two Wi-Fi access points for 350 I think that's pretty good. Yeah, um, that is good. And that, it's, pr- it's going to be a good router too. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess we should look up, does it get the oh my goodness speed? Because <laughs> <laughs> like the... Where are the specs on this bad boy? Um, <laughs> okay, tech specs. Here we go. The Nest Wi-Fi router, 802.11s mesh Wi-Fi. Uh, that's not what I want. Self-healing yeah. network. Oh, protective band steering. Uh, it has Bluetooth LE built in, and they're not saying. Why are they not saying? Oh, here we go. Um, 2.4. No, 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 no. Yep. It doesn't say unless I am missing specs. it. I don't see it here that tells me whether it can go up to a gigabit of of uh, connectivity. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think. All right, I'm going to send an email <laughs> to Google and get back to that. Uh, see, because of... I, well, I'm not going to upgrade. I'm fine with my Eero stuff. And and by the way, full disclosure, Eero is a sponsor of the network. Um, I did get my Eero base station and beacons before I was ever part of the network. Um, regardless, we, we, uh, our sponsors are tech that we actually enjoy and want to use and, uh, services that we enjoy and want to use or want to share with people. So, uh, you never have to worry about us like pitching something out there that's not worth people's time. So in any Mm -hmm. case, I really like my Euro stuff and I have no reason to upgrade right now. But I wouldn't mind having that full gigabit, even though I don't have gigabit right now. It's no. <laughs> see, this is your fault, actually. Now that I think <laughs> now, about it. Now you feel bad about it. Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't even care before. I didn't know. I didn't care before. Uh, oh, so Bleak says uh, that two gigabit Ethernet ports per Wi-Fi point. Oh, nice. Um, that is good. So, yeah, I guess it is there. Uh, that's great. It also, with the 
with the Wi-Fi access points, it has something called a privacy switch, um, which I assume lets you turn off the Google Assistant on those uh, points, mm-hmm. which is kind of yeah, nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the we, physical switches for all that is good. I agree. And in fact, that's kind of the, the next little topic here. Um, th- this is interesting because I just... Uh, my Nest Cam has been... I, I had it in my home, but I have not set it up where I want it yet. But I was uh, out in Silicon Valley, I think last weekend. Um, regardless, I went somewhere. And so I wanted to have my cameras with my dog so I could check in, make sure they were okay while I was uh, gone for, you know, the six or seven hours. Um, and so I set it up in like a temporary setting and plugged it in and booted up the, <laughs> booted up, like it took forever to connect me. <laughs> It was connecting to the booted. modem. Yeah. Uh, so once it was booted up um, and I had it all ready to go, I got the notification that I needed to switch it over from Nest to Google. And so I had to migrate my account from a Nest account to a Google account. I had to go through and give the Google Assistant access. And then I had to go through and let uh, Alpha, that's Amazon's voice assistant hmm. that we're calling Alpha, uh, gain access through Google instead of Nest. And it was a whole process. But apparently, this has some folks, um, some folks who build houses with IoT in mind, Internet of Things in mind, it has them not using Nest products anymore because yeah. of the concerns with Google and their privacy. I think it's even whether or not it's privacy, I think it's somewhat like, they're like, oh, you want to live here? You have to sign up for a Google account now. And before it was like, regardless of what platform you used, you could you could choose whether or not to do it. And then now it is like, oh, do you want to live here? Okay, here's your Google, like what's your Google account? And that is like pretty limiting of a choice. Yeah, um, that lock-in is kind of, uh, that's not a good look. Yeah, that's fascinating. And um. The Verge had an article that was Nest is getting ready for the smart homes Cambridge Analytica moment, which is a pithy headline about like the smart home privacy and all that Nest stuff. Nest first iteration of that wasn't exactly super secure. And so they're bringing it back in now. I think what's fascinating is everything's going to be limited in sort of routines or you give them like total access. And so I'm fascinated what exactly that will be because as somebody who maybe likes Siri shortcuts, I can do any type of routine type system now that I want. And so I'm fascinated to see how limited this will get as like maybe Google started out with the doors wide open and they're kind of shutting it a little bit now. So I'm curious if people will feel that pressure and feel like they're more limited, even though Google has like, this huge wide access. I think what should have happened here, if I'm in charge of Google, what should have happened here was Google has been working on acquiring Nest for forever. And they should have figured out what all the the Nest cam or the Nest devices worked with, all the partnerships that were in place, and then gone to those companies and worked out new integrations that would easily carry over through Google's platform. Instead of switching to Google first and then working that out sort of in the in the after effects of it, because, yeah, I mean, now they've they've basically blocked out a whole revenue stream where a company knew that they could install a Nest thermostat, they could install a Nest cam or three, and they could set that up with an August smart lock, for example, uh, as well as a few other, I don't know, Samsung Smart Things products in the home that were for security. And then the person could come in, and as long as they had a Nest account, they were able to access all of those different devices, and they would all work together. And so then you could have the Smart Lock. Um, when it is unlocked, then it would immediately turn off the webcam, and when it's locked or, or whatever, you know, all of these different integrations that worked so well Mm -hmm. that were easy to get set up by sort of locking off everything first. I get it from the, from the perspective of like, Oh boy, we need to do an audit and we need to make sure that everything's running, but should they not have done this audit ahead of time? That's what seems a little, um, 
I, I can say this, bass backwards to me. <laughs> I think, I mean, in general, that process of renegotiating with every single partner is probably just like laborious compared to being like, now you have to listen to us <laughs> and go the other way around. Um, it is, they do, yeah, they do say you'll have like annual privacy audits from a third party firm and, but it is like, that seems pretty intense for something. Yeah. Like they should have done that earlier. But I think, I think a whole thing too is that Nest was supposedly going to be a separate company when Google acquired it. And this is, I mean, this is sort of like the, um, warning for every startup out there is you get acquired and it's like, Oh, we're not going to change anything. And then it's like four years later, it's like, yeah, now we're going to start changing stuff. So that happened with WhatsApp that happened with Instagram that happened with ring. So it's like pretty common. Um, I, yeah, they probably should have done that a little bit sooner, <laughs> but I guess as is with the tech industry lately, maybe they're not motivated to do the right thing until they get caught doing the wrong uh, thing. <laughs> yeah, which is a big bummer. I, <laughs> see, I guess when I think of it from the perspective of of they're worried because they have to do these security audits and things like that, then that's where I'm on Google's side and they're like, yes, go there, make them do these things. But they could have had these conversations earlier. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this from the outside looking in, so I'm sure that there was some of this going on, but it does feel like it ends up being user hostile instead of, of, um, provider hostile or manufacturer hostile, yeah. which that's where the hostility that. yeah, should be. Yeah. Don't, that's a good point. Don't taste the, me, uh, bro. Taste the, the externality is the, to use the one, my fancy term from last time is it is put on you. And now, people are starting to run into that is like suddenly you can't use your Google assistant with your work gown or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, but even so, I mean, even to go on to like the next story too, that just came out today was that there's a couple, um, Amazon skills and Google home skills that can f basically like fake that they're done with their skill and then keep listening afterwards where it would be like, Oh, like here's your horoscope for the day Ew. and then make a recorded sound that sounds like it's done listening <gasps> and then it'll do nothing. And then like five minutes later is like, Oh, there's an error connecting to your account. Please say your password or like, so I guess, I mean, this is one of those things that I can see your Micah's face. Yeah. Is, again, making tons I've of got, faces. Yeah. There are so many I faces. I do think it was security researchers that, demonstrated a lot of this so i'm not sure how much this was actually in the wild and it was happening to people but they demonstrated that it could like completely record everything you were saying and so i think i'm not sure if it's still going on right now but um they like a lot of i think amazon and google are reviewing like every single skill to make sure that this can't happen i um, I think that's great. I, I want those <clears throat> reviews to take place. I want that to be, you know, yeah. done. And, and so from that perspective, I think that that's a, this is a good thing. And if this is what it took to make that happen, then that's great. Um, so I, I, before we move on though, I do want to say one thing that I have, I've made a series shortcut that is a lie. Um, oh, to somebody, test it? <laughs> not exactly like this, but some, it doesn't do this thing for sure because it can't just like keep listening and record what you're saying. But it did make me think of somebody was telling me how they were stuck in a cab and their cab driver, it's like one of those things where you don't want to tell them that they're going the wrong way or that they're taking like the wrong, like an unideal route because then yeah. it's like, oh, what? You looked it up on your map. You don't trust me kind of thing. Yeah, it's and so a little I, intense. Yeah. I saw her tweet and I made a shortcut where it just said out loud, like accident ahead, please use an alternate route. And then it was like map information is provided by Google maps and it's oh, none of wow. this is real, but it just says it out loud. So you could be like, Oh weird. My phone is telling me like, <laughs> I thought I called it fake your cabbie. So that's, oh. that's a, that is you're in control and it's not, it's a little, maybe that's more of a prank zone. But. Right. <laughs> but still, I mean, it's a, it's a proof of concept that does get a little, that's a little scary, <laughs> a little hairy, a little scary, uh, for sure. Um, okay. Well, that's creepy. Uh, I'm going to try to, now I'm the one doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, 
if you out there want to see all of the ridiculous faces that I'm making while we're recording this show, you can tune in live by going to twit.tv slash live and check out the show there. But even better, this show is currently an audio only podcast as we're getting it off the ground. Uh, this being just episode three. But if we get to 30,000 subscribers, then we will turn on a uh, video for the show and provide it in video as well. So that's you share it with your friends, share it wide and far. And that's your way to see the ridiculous faces I make when Matthew says things that scare me, um, as well as a number of other things that we'll do with video once we have it. Uh, but we are keeping the audio version in mind, even if we do go live with video. So I think I made, I've only made one mistake so far where I said, as you can see, as I held up my phone, uh. Um, but outside of that, I'm doing my best to try not to, not to let that happen, even if we uh, go all in on video. Okay. We have got to move on because we yes. are past an hour. Um, and so I thought that it would be fun. We, I'm excited to say that we've got some guests coming up soon, some guest interviews coming up soon. Uh, today I am finally folks, I moved to, uh, California at the end of July, basically we could say August 1st is when I was really like here, all of my stuff was here, et cetera. And as of last week, most of my stuff, except for my kitchen, my bedroom and my, my bathroom, those places were pretty well filled out with my things, but everywhere else, including like the living room space and everything else was mostly still in boxes. And in fact, my living room has been a storage box space for the, as long as I've been here, I just have not had the time, the energy and the, I don't know, mental wherewithal to get all of it set up and taken out of boxes, et cetera. And I may have gone even longer, but I got the inspiration to start to, uh, put things, uh, like take things out and put things together a little bit more. And part of that process, of course, involves uh, setting up my smart home officially, uh, which is still well underway. But one of the things that I hadn't considered that goes along with setting up your smart home is that right now we still don't have a, I don't know, system we don't have a Tesla coil in the middle of our houses that can provide wireless power to everything. So a lot of stuff has to plug in. And with plugins come wires. I literally almost grabbed for a wire on my shirt that I was going to hold up and show to the camera. So I'm glad I didn't have a wire on my shirt. So I did not fail this time about us not being a video podcast. But uh, with wires comes the desire for cable management. And so Matthew and I thought we'd talk a little bit about cable management for your smart home today. And this is an interesting conversation to me because I think different people not only have different definitions for what they consider to be cable management, but have different processes for what they can for, for their cable management and have different um, opin opinions, uh, both visually, aesthetically, and, and I don't know, like electronically. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I don't like to see wires. Uh, I don't, <laughs> If I could, I would have everything wireless. That's not a possibility. So the next best thing is owning my home so that I can put holes in the wall and sort of pass wires through and, you know, set up a port on all these different sides, which is something that when I lived in Missouri, the I didn't have to own my home. The rules, the the the, the landlords there tend, tend to be indiv individuals rather than companies. And with individuals, you can have conversations that involve, hey, is it okay if I do some stuff to the house as long as when I move out, it's going to look how it looked when I moved in? And then they would say, absolutely. If it doesn't look how it looked when you moved in, then you're going to have some of your security deposit taken away. But here in California, there are way more rules surrounding that. And a lot of yeah. times it's companies and not individuals. So I am not putting holes in my wall, uh, like big, cutting out holes in my wall and things like that. Um, and so, you know, short of owning my own home here in California, ha, I'm a millennial. I have avocado toast to eat. Uh, I am trying to find different ways of doing that. And one of those ways is using, uh, routing cable holder dealies. <laughs> They're like these <laughs> plastic trays that lock in and they stick to, or can be screwed into the wall 
and then you can pass the cable through them and the, the, the cover gets clicked over the top and then you can paint them so that there's the same color as the wall. Yeah. Now, I know they're there and I can see them and they stick out like a sore thumb for about a month and then I forget about them and most of the time guests pay little attention to the fact that they're there. Uh, so it's good enough for me. But then there are also some situations where you want to have your smart lighting in a, in a specific place and I'm going to speak specifically to a, a problem that I have right now. Um, I think that it is a an insult to the beauty that <laughs> is a fireplace to put your television over the top of your fireplace. Oh, yeah. Like to wow. make that, I think that make, well, I think it's an insult to a living room space to make the television the focal point of your living room as well. Uh, <laughs> I know I'm coming in hot, coming in, yeah, coming geez, in controversial. This is, this is loaded. Uh, but I don't like the idea of making a television the focal point in the living room. And so above my fireplace, I have put some nano leaf um, tiles on oh, the yeah, wall nice. in a pattern that I've set up that I wanted to have. Unfortunately, there's no uh, power cable or there's no there's no power port up above the television or up above yeah. the, the fireplace because they too believe that your television should not be above your fireplace. <laughs> so thank you for that. But the problem is the nearest cable is very far away. Now, if I lived in Missouri, I would go to my breaker box, turn off all the power and cut um, a, a hole in the wall and install an after uh, or, or an old work box and put in a power uh, outlet and all that stuff. And I love doing that stuff, but I don't live in Missouri and so I cannot do that. And so instead I've got to route the cable and use an extension cord. And so it's this whole process. And with that comes some of the, the stuff that I'm using for that. Uh, cable ties are my best friend. For days. Uh, for days. The I think Go ahead. The, the pair that you have linked in the Amazon description, I bought in 2014 and haven't finished using because it's still so many. So yes. that's, oh, that, that's a good one. I have, <laughs> I've bought two since I started buying, like two bags since I started buying them. And that, bo that bag full of this rolls and rolls. And by the way, out there, all of you folks who love to, to send emails about Velcro, these are actually Velcro brand hook and loop uh, fasteners. So don't come at me. They are Velcro. They're not just a hook and loop by a third party. Um, these one wrap thin ties are great for just normal cable management for, for like picking up slack. You can get them in different colors. Uh, another product that I have not linked yet that I will be linking is probably my favorite product. And they are these clear plastic cable clips. And so they have a, a sticky mm -hmm. port sticky port no a sticky part on the back but also a hole in the middle so that you can fasten them to the wall and then they have what looks like a it's it's a uh, a piece that hangs off that looks like a ladder and hmm. you put the cable uh onto the clip and then you take the ladder part that's like a strap and put it over the top of the cable and sort of click it in and it cl 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 clicks closed and so it wow. holds the cables fastened against the wall and oh, you can I have multiple cables. Okay. Yeah. It, it was kind of hard. Just check the show notes. You'll see what I'm talking about. It is a little bit hard to explain, but they're like cable clips instead of just cable fasteners. And but it's like adjustable, right? Yeah, it's adjustable. Next. So you can, it, it fits whatever kind of cables you've got. If you've got an HDMI running right next to a power running next to some, I don't know, speaker wire, it's all going to go in that one cable very easily. Um, and so that's kind of the extent of what I use other than, Occasionally, I'll get some, like I said, the first thing that I mentioned, some cable routing uh, stuff, which mm -hmm. I have to cut those into, you know, the precise pieces and, and uh, paint them and stuff. So I don't know. I'm, I'm in the process right now of deciding if I can rework my feels about visible cables mm -hmm. or if I need to just go all in and, and buy another cable routing kit to do it. And so we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what, what is your setup? How much cable management do you do uh, with your desk, with your other smart stuff? And where does it all, uh, what, what do you use to make it happen? Well, I have an interesting situation. Um, given that I live in an old Berkeley home, we I love don't this. even, the old Berkeley we don't, home. 
we don't even have grounded plugs. So what? we have to like get converters. Is and that then, legal? I don't I don't know. I mean, we do live in California, so there's not like thunderstorms a whole lot or anything like that. Um, no, stop it. Do not give excuses <clears throat> for your landlord. I have surge pr- protector. It's it's a family home, so I think that's probably it's one of those things where updating it would probably like <laughs> How can it you would cost su- it's just got two. It's got the two outlets instead of the one at the bottom, and so it doesn't have the grounding have like adapt- prong. Yeah, we just have like adapters, and then we use. Um, <laughs> Micah, I'm gonna buy you. I have nine everything fire in this office for Christmas. Yeah, people can't see this, so this is an audio podcast. But over there is where my one outlet in this entire room is, and I have a wire going behind me around my closet, like, and then out around this side of the room. And then over and then <laughs> underneath my computers. <laughs> and in all of those, I have about like eight or so things plugged in. Um, so <laughs> See, normally this is where I'd plug my ears, but I'm wearing in-ear <laughs> monitors, so I can't plug my ears. So this is, I have a slightly uh, dangerous. I'm calling setup, PG&E maybe. and they're going to turn off your power yeah, for the safety of say, everyone else. They don't even care. Um <sighs> But so it's, I mean, we haven't ha- ever had any sort of problems. I do think if you can use you knock on wood two first, space please. heaters upstairs, it will. Yeah, here. Uh, Thank there you. There we go. Oh, um, boy. We do like if you run two space heaters up here, it'll like blow out the <laughs> thing. But that's like pretty common in houses that you can't run multiple because those actually yes. use more than the average electricity. More but than the average bear, right? <laughs> I, I do have little runners throughout all the walls too so you couldn't even if you walked in here you probably wouldn't even notice i guess one of them is on the ground um but then i have like in my closet i have hanging um hanging outlets too so that at any time i can plug in and charge stuff i should i gotta do a video on my hanging outlet it's just like a power strip that i just have hooked over something so that they're like accessible and then i have i have like a whole charging station in my closet that's all set up um and then actually so I did buy the IKEA um, cable management kit and it was great until like two weeks later when they all started to fall off the bottom <laughs> side of my desk. Um, so that was slightly, I mean, I'm pretty sure I peeled up, peeled a lot of them off again and moved them, but still do they not, not exactly the, it's just like three it's an IKEA, so it's not like the craziest right. stickiness in the world. But um, yeah, I spent like a bunch of time because I mean, I okay, the other thing I did was I got this long power strip that has like, it's like an industrial power strip where there's like three inches in between each of the plugs because mm-hmm. I'd like to actually use every one of those plugs. Right. And now I am, which is nice. Um, the thing that specifically I ran into with cable management was the HomePod because it has one single cord, which means it's really easy to move. And that is actually great like i will regularly on the weekend bring my home pod out of my office and downstairs so that we can just use it and because it takes no setup at all i just have to plug it in and it's good to go i do that but i constantly like every time i did my cable management i would zip tie the entire cord into this setup and then like two weeks later be like oh now i need to take it out so that is it's like i am curious do you do anything like that where you have something that's not part of the like cable it's unmanaged maybe yeah so right now my home pod is so the other problem with the home pod is that the cord it, it seems like apple may have known that people are going to be moving their home pods around because they've really like they've got the nylon braided cord yeah, but the great. problem with the nylon braided cord is that it's very difficult to get to do what you want it to do. It doesn't yeah. <laughs> bend very well. It doesn't hold very well. And I've got mine. Um, my kitchen is set up such that there is the main countertop on which uh, most of my cooking prep and stuff like that happens. And the sink is there, but then right behind it is a higher raised countertop where you can set plants mm-hmm. and things like that. And then behind that is the window that's in the kitchen. Um, And to the right of my window is where I have a light that's a Philips Hue light, but then I also put my HomePod right there. And so it can play music in the kitchen, into the dining room, into the living room space. That's all just one big space. And right now the cable that the, that the lamp is, the power is the lamp and the cable that the, that obviously powers the HomePod. Those are both plugged in to an outlet 
that is uh, on the wall a little bit to the mm-hmm. right of the counter space. And so it just is sort of in that corner. The cables are a little bit hidden, but it's not very good. And so yeah. I'm trying to think of the best way to go about that because I could like wrap the home pod around the base of the lamp, the, the cord around the base of the lamp. And then oh, yeah. sort of, there's only a little bit of slack to plug it in. But again, it's like, it's, it's, I don't know yet. And the home pod is like the biggest issue uh, of all of them for me because of the way that the cable is set up. But there's not a whole lot else that, uh, I tend to be a bigger fan of the, I have a uh, boom, it, it used to be called, I think, Ultimate Ears, but they're really getting away from that, so they just go by UE, oh, yeah. but I have a UE Boom 3 that's like waterproof and all that stuff, and I love that nice. thing, and I just carry it around the house with me. It, it's like the shape of a large LaCroix can, <laughs> um, and so I I find myself using that more often because of its portability and oh, the fact that it has no cord, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't have too much that, cause I don't, when I set up my, my cable management, especially for my desk, I don't do it in a way that it has in, if there's anything that I know I'm going to have to move, then it's not going to be set yeah. up in such a way that I would need to. Um, and so oftentimes I'll end up having more that is not cable managed because of that fact that I, that I don't want to adjust that. Um, yeah. I feel like my biggest thing with cable management was just getting it better than what it was. So it's like not, I wouldn't say mine's like YouTube perfect right now or anything, but before when I would sit, especially cause I have a standing desk, I would raise my desk and I just saw like a jungle of cords <laughs> hanging down. And now they're like, most of them are wrapped up where they need to be. And that's good. And the one big thing that I did that this is probably better for video nerds, but I have a big light stand behind me over here and I put Velcro all over the cord and then Velcro on the light stand. <gasps> and so the cord wraps out and then on down the back of the light stand. And it's like you can't even tell <gasps> that the cord's there at all. And I was like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of that one. And then the other part is I Where have did this you cl- I need this like what was this it's, Amazon? It's just, Where was uh, no, these are just the normal Velcro. Uh, you can buy like a roll of Velcro. That's like not attached to anything, and you can just cut it. Um, okay. And then I just I'm put that on. This. Yeah. And then uh, uh, the other thing I got from IKEA is they have these really cool, um, you know, in like industrial places, almost like probably the Twit Studio has a little uh, outlet box that goes up on the wall. That's like a square, kind of like old school looking thing. Yeah. IKEA sells basically that with like a ten foot braided cord, and so it looks really cool. And I have this. Uh, along with those other outlets, it's just on a hook in my closet. And so I can literally unhook like a 10 foot cord and move it into the center of my room and then unvelcro my light stand and put it right on that. And it's like a perfect seamless setup. And I was like, yeah, I need to get it. The one thing would be, I have this everywhere else, but I might need to get another outlet so that I can have all of my lights turn on with Siri. Oh boy. Another (laughs) outlet in this undergrounded home. And then it's going to blow up. (laughs) Oh my uh, we have aye, aye. renter's insurance. So. Well, that's good. <laughs> I'm really happy for you about that. I'm also really concerned. I don't know. I gotta, well, if you can do all those, the wall outlets and stuff, that's maybe I'll true. have to have maybe you I come, need to come set over and, on, and fix all my stuff for yeah, me. Yeah, I'll come over and upgrade your home to modern electricity <laughs> code. I, that's a joke. Good because luck with that. I was going to say. California's, it's like I'm 50s, sure, is... So. Uh, California's code, I'm sure, is wild. I wouldn't even want to try to dig into that, but, uh, Missouri's is already enough, but (laughs) I'm genuinely surprised that they do in California, especially that they still let people, are you like, do you not to, I don't know, get to it's a family. It's my girlfriend's grandmother's home. So it's like, okay. So it is like a family, family landlord relations. Gotcha. 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 Okay. That's, that was my one question. I'm like, if they, I was surprised they're allowed to rent out this home, but I understand now that's that's, a little bit different. Yeah. I think that's just kind of Berkeley though, is like we have a gas stove and everything. So, oh, but gas stoves are so much better than electric stoves. Not, not it's uh, legal in Berkeley going forward. You can't install them anymore because it's, what? I just don't think it's like practical or good for the environment, but but it makes it's such a better cooking experience. I I'm I mean, looking. I need yeah. to not right now, but I gotta <laughs> see about Petaluma here because that's some that's some utter nonsense, is what I'll say mm. because this is not an explicit show. Uh, we have got to move on, so yeah. let's go ahead and talk about uh, our picks of the week, and I would like to hear about yours first. 
Sure. So I was looking for some, or I don't necessarily look for it, but I'm glad that my Twitter community shows this stuff to me. I found two good accessibility finds that I thought was interesting. One is that um, Google Slides can now have captions and closed captions as you're going along, which is awesome. So people who are watching along with a presentation can turn on captions. And I'm not sure if this is tied into like the translation thing that they were doing earlier, but it basically just makes something like a presentation a lot more accessible to people who have less, uh, hearing disabilities or something like that. Um, but then the other thing that I saw was really cool. And this person tweeted about it because they were like, please, like somebody else talk about this is the uh, Braille keyboard, which I honestly had never seen before. And it's like a full electronic keyboard that works with Braille. I don't I can't, it's kind of hard to describe without looking at it, but the link's in the description because she was like, the TSA was like, what is this? This isn't real. And she was like, this is what I use every single day. Oh, so I thought, I thought that was fascinating. Because I and know I'm, they have like Braille displays and things like that. So this is a little bit different than... Yeah, it's like got raised bumps on a lot of the... key. It almost looks oh, like, it a, looks like a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's a... But then it's got all the little... I don't know. It's hard to describe. I don't totally understand... But it seems fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, folks, you can click on the link in the show notes to see the the uh, Braille keyboard. But yeah, it's got function keys and everything. And uh, yeah, that's that's really neat. I'd love to like if anybody has used one of these or knows someone who uses about it, please let us know because mm -hmm. this would be interesting to learn more about. Absolutely, I agree. Um, all right, so my uh, pick of the week is a new. Uh, it, it comes in a in a pack. You can get two of them. Uh, Philips Hue is, in my opinion, the best smart lighting system that Me you too. can <laughs> put your money into. I will say that uh, Lifex gets a close second, and there are some things that they do that I feel are much better, including their LED light strip. Um, Philips Hue charges an mm -hmm. arm and a leg for their LED light strip, and you can only light it in one color across the strip. Uh, it, and by one color across the strip, I don't mean it only shows up in white. I mean, you can do millions of colors, but the whole strip has to be that millions of color, whichever color you choose. Philips Hue, or go ahead. No, I was just going to say, why did you tell me about this? Because now I want the life strip. The, <laughs> yeah, Lifex the Lifex light strip, you can, it's got 16 oh, zones, wow. I believe. And so each of those zones can be a different color. And I used to, uh, when I did I, the iMore show uh, for over at Mobile Nations, my, the, the table that I had sitting behind, or that like cabinet that I had sitting behind me, I put the Lifex light strip on the back of it and I would have the color rotating throughout. So it was like purple, oh, okay. red, and blue. And it was basically uh, smart tech today colors. And the colors Does this just... need its own like hub thing or no, it's a the one thing that always kills me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so see by now. Right. Okay. So that's one of the, like, <laughs> it's on the way. <laughs> Lifex gets second uh, place for me simply because they, Every single one of their devices is a Wi-Fi connected device. And after a while, that can start to clog the network a little bit. Um, and so that is a bit of an issue. Whereas if you have with, with Philips Hue, it all is being communicated via the bridge. That's oh, a nice okay. sort of central point to, to do all of the, the management. And I, I appreciate that. So on the topic of the Philips Hue kit, uh, set, I just got these uh, play Philips Hue Play light bars. And they are these um, lozenge shaped. They're sort of um, <laughs> elongated. Oh, I don't know. It's not exactly selling them <laughs> lozenges yeah. for your light bulb. Lozenges no, for yeah. Um, that, but they're, they're like they're like longer so that they can. It's not just one bulb. It's kind of like a tray almost. Yeah. But it can stand up vertically to too. It's like if you took a sound bar, an average sound yeah, bar, and you cut exactly. it in half and you put a piece of, um, of translucent uh, plastic on the front of it that lets it stream light through. That's what this thing looks like. And so they're each adjustable to the bajillion Ds of colors. And they're the perfect lights to serve as um, sort of statement pieces uh, to add color to like a wall or what I'm going to be using them for, which is putting one on either side of my television to sort of give some backlighting as the tele, like when the television is on and in use, um, mm. it is, they're, they're very pretty. They can, they can be 
set up in all sorts of ways. So uh, they have like a, a wedge base. And so you can set them to sort of rock away from you or rock toward you. And then they also come with a little thing that lets you stand them up on their side. And so they can uh, sort of sit tall and uh, put out light. And I was really impressed. Um, usually what I've been disappointed with with Philips Hue's lights, is, with their light accessories. So their bulbs are great. They're very bright. Um, on par with LifeX. So that's another place where LifeX mm. gets bonus points. They do have very bright bulbs. Um, but Philips Hue, their accessories tend to be pretty dark in comparison. And so some of their stuff, it is literally just to add like a little bit of color to a room. It's not for actually lighting things up. But these are uh, yeah. 500 some lumens, which is not super, super, super bright by any means. It's not going to light up your, you know, your living room, but 500 is high for what I'm used to, which is like 200 lumens for their multicolor lighting accessories. Oh yeah. Wow. So I like that for, for that specific reason. And folks out there, if you don't know what I'm talking about with lumens, lumens is just a, uh, a, agreed upon I, as what I'm trying to say, like internationally agreed upon measurement of how bright something is. And so isn't it the amount of light it gives off per like square inch? The amount so? of light so, in a thing. Well, uh, we should, I do want to do, maybe we should follow up on a separate episode about knits also. Oh yeah. Cause lux, yeah. Knits. Because there's all like deep fusion for the iPhone works between 10 and 700 lux, which is, a measurement of light when you're the perspective looking at it, but not when you're the thing giving off. The, it's all like, are you ready? Uh, in the eye of the beholder is mostly what it is. Absolutely. I think the difference. It's like whether the product is doing it or a screen or it's what you see. Cause like technically brightness is relative. It's like, this is a hard way to measure versus like what you see might just be your eyes are sensitive. Mm -hmm. So the uh, scientific definition it is uh, the unit of luminous flux equal to the amount of light emitted per second in a unit solid angle of one st steradian from a uniform source of one candela. Well, that clears it up. Yeah, so, so you know, it's on. that. Um, <laughs> no, basically, the way that I describe it is, how bright is it? And what I, how, I don't do that by knowing what an individual lumen looks like, like one lumen. What I do is I compare it to, I've got bulbs in my house that I love for their brightness value that are 800 lumens. And so relative yeah. to 800 lumens, I also have things that are 200 lumens. And so I know 500 lumens is somewhere uh, around the middle of that. And that's brighter than I'm used to from Philips Hughes accessories. So I tend to like very bright lights. Lighting is very functional for me and I want it to, to light up whatever it is that I'm working on. Um, but anywho, this, the, these Philips Hue play light bars, which you can get in a double pack, um, are really great if you're trying to add some color to your, your home or to yeah. your setup or whatever. Uh, and what I love about it is that the plug that it comes with has a spot for three uh, Philips Hue light bars. And so you, you oh. plug it in and you can plug in up to three into that. the one, right? <laughs> into the one thing. Oh, I'm like grabbing my head because I'm like, that's because that's specifically with this. I have the Hue Go, the like portable one, and then the light strip on my desk. And they both take huge chunk and outlets. Huge. And it's like not necessary. I, I wish, is this also sold separately? Because I would love that. Yes. These are, these are good like <laughs> they are good yeah uh, that's a recommendation there um, that's why they're my pick of the week because they're yeah good. <laughs> but it's it's because i think the light strip tends to be pretty specific and and also like i mean you can literally i cut my light strip to fit and then i like wanted to move it and i was like crap now i cut it in half um, oh yeah or like even my problem with mine is that it's on the back of my desk pointing at the wall not up on the wall behind my desk where i'd actually want it so maybe i will I might have to get this also. Dang it. Oh, Micah. man. So, so mm. go with your life for now and we'll see what comes next. But yeah. um, I know somebody out there is going to hit you up with this via email or tweet. So I'm just going to tell you this now. You can get um, the these little, they sell them on Amazon, but they're specific for LED light strips and they are little connectors. And so if you end oh, up yeah. cutting and you want to re, if you end up cutting and you want to reconnect, you can do so. I think the first time I bought mine, 
that was what I bought at the Apple store was the extension. Cause I was like, wow, this is only 30 bucks. And it was like, oh, wow. get home. And I was like, what? Okay. Just kidding. You need the whole $90 thing also. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's true. Well, the, and these don't even have, they're just like, uh, they're about an inch long. They don't have any led lights on them. Uh-uh. They're just wires that one side clamps mm. to the led light strip that you cut on one side and one clamps to the other side. And it just reconnects them via the wires. Oh, so nice. there's, I think you can get them for like, you get 10 of them for three bucks or something. Hmm. Um, That's cool. So it's a way to sort of undo after you've done, which I, I find kind of nice. Um, okay. We've nice. got uh, a couple of questions here and they are, I believe both about shortcuts. Um, but we've got Samantha from Shreveport, Louisiana, Louisiana, who asks, So every day when I get to work, I have to put my iPhone, my iPad, and my Apple Watch on silent. It's not a hard task, but I often forget a device, and then I'm reminded when it makes a sound. Is there a way to create a shortcut that will automatically silence my devices when I get to work and then do the reverse when I leave? Now, here's the kicker. I don't want to use the Do Not Disturb feature because I still want the notifications. I just can't do the sounds because it annoys my boss and my coworkers. Ah, I like that. Um, I don't think it can happen with the Apple Watch, but there is just the set volume action in shortcuts that you could just set it to zero. And then I do think with automations would be the main way to make it happen. Although the arrive and leave automations don't trigger in the background without they require confirmation. So it would show a notification when you got to work in order to turn it on. That that is sort of a limitation of the location actions that um, Apple or the location automations that Apple made available. I think this might be a common theme, but NFC tags are probably a pretty good way to go. Um, the other thing that this might work, depending on your situation, is if you do tend to open any specific apps at work. Like if you have oh. one that you only ever use there, that could be a trigger to start that. Um, but yeah, I think so. It's just the set volume action is in the scripting category in shortcuts. But yeah, that is smart. Just because see, I use a location bubble, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it is location stuff. Can't the automation can't work automatically, which is <laughs> that's a bummer. <laughs> that's definitely like the major criticism of automations is a lot of people think it's like pointless because of that. It's like not even automated. That's on some level, mm-hmm. but, um, that's what you get when you take the name from the HomeKit app and put it into something else. So <laughs> Yeah. See, because I guess that's the bummer there is that if uh, Samantha is having trouble with remembering mm-hmm. to yeah. make them quiet, then is she going to remember to tap an NFC tag when she gets to work? But you, So with the location thing, you can have it show up and say, yeah, I want to yeah. run this. So then if she's getting a notification, then that would be okay. Like, yeah, when it I get to work, would do it for you, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and that you can also do the Wi-Fi network is a clever way to do it. If oh, you don't that's like, right. Yeah. The work Wi-Fi. I don't know why you would do that. I mean, sometimes you can like disconnect from Wi-Fi and reconnect. So it might be kind of annoying if that, if you're like moving oh, in between buildings or right. something like that. Um, that is actually a common thing It'd with nice the automations. If, was, if you could say on first connect to this yeah. Wi-Fi network, do this. Like for the day or yeah, something for like the, that. Yeah, for the day. Some but I, I definitely found like a lot of the location ones because it doesn't trigger automatically. I like look at my phone and there's like five built up and I was like, oh, I didn't even <laughs> None know of those about ran. that. Um, hmm. Yeah. So that, that one's a little awkward. It's a little bit of a bummer. <clears throat> I'm going to have to, I'm going to play around with that on, uh, on Android and see... Mm-hmm see how the location stuff works there for those specific things. We'll <laughs> Tasker see. probably could do something like that. I do think that's, I will eat my own words that the Android stuff can definitely get more access to your phone, but hopefully nothing else is going on sur- uh, suspiciously in the background doing that either. So, <laughs> mm. uh, okay, here's the other one. Uh, Nicholas Radcliffe from somewhere, Indiana, which by the way, folks, if you send us a, a question or feedback and you don't include your location, you are automatically a citizen of somewhere, Indiana. Same thing as uh, mm-hmm. iOS today. Is it possible to toggle tethering on and off when the iPhone connects or disconnects to a particular Bluetooth connection? This is something I would do on a jailbroken iPhone. Now that it is more difficult to jailbreak, 
I have gone to an Android device, which is possible to add this functionality. I would like to go back to iOS, but this functionality is a must have for me. Yeah, I think it's unfortunately the same type of thing. Um, I, I guess even though um, tethering itself isn't an action in shortcuts yet. And so this is a big problem that I think basically Apple's own teams also just got the APIs to make Siri shortcuts. And so they haven't yet. Like the numbers team is the only one who's really done anything beyond what's I guess there are shortcuts actions from other teams too, but since the main launch, I've only seen one Apple app actually have that. App? So this might, yeah. Oh, um, so cool. you can add it to spreadsheets, which is very cool. I'm going to make, uh, I have one where as I'm trying to identify scenes that I need to shoot B-roll when I'm shoot writing my scripts, I can ask my HomePod and it will like gather the information and then I open my phone and it adds it to a spreadsheet. But um, at least this type of thing right now isn't possible. Bluetooth also has the same security limitation where it won't just run in the background because you don't control when a Bluetooth device specifically connects to your phone. It can just connect if it's already been connected before. So I think that was another security problem where they didn't want it to be like, oh, if you suddenly like enter a room that connects to your Bluetooth, it can log a bunch of data in the background. But it is um, the one thing that I would recommend is... Um, Federico Vitici has a article that has a bunch of deep links into settings. So you could have an automation when you paired a particular Bluetooth device that opens into the screen where you can do the tethering, but it won't flip the toggle for you. So you can get like 80% of the you way there. So close. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of, it's a, that is a downside of shortcuts right now is there's a lot of stuff that I think people are like, they have all of the right ideas and it's like, Give it six months, maybe, hopefully. So, yeah, that well, would be my recommendation. There you go. Uh, folks, that is going to wrap up this episode of Smart Tech Today. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you have feedback or questions or a project that you really would like to, to have us work on, you can send those to stt at twit.tv. Now, right now we are testing out uh, streaming the show. Well, we, we always stream the show to Twitch, but actually having a chat going on in Twitch. And we're going to test that out for a little bit longer, see how that goes. Um, but we record the show live every Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's 4 p.m. Pacific, which is 2300 UTC. The idea there is that we're trying to get people after they are off of work and either before they've eaten dinner or after they've eaten dinner. And so that way we can get you all hanging out uh, with us and, and uh, having the conversation live if you want to. So head to twit.tv slash live. That gives you access to all the different streams that we have across the different platforms or join us on twitch, T-W-I-T-C-H dot TV slash twit, T-W-I-T, which is where uh, you can uh, hang out in the chat as well. Uh, Matthew, if people want to follow you online or get in touch, how might they do so? The best way would be to visit my website is matthewcastanelli.com yes. or on Twitter at Matt Castanelli because <laughs> my name doesn't fit in the character limit. <laughs> that That's a, a little bit of a bummer. And you're also <laughs> on YouTube, correct? Yes, uh, youtube.com slash Matthew Castanelli. Beautiful. Uh, you can follow me on pretty much all of the social things at Micah Sargent. Um, and that's, that's pretty much the best way to uh, get in touch there course, don't forget to subscribe to the show. You can head to twit.tv slash STT, where we have links to all the places to subscribe. But if you're listening in your podcast app of choice, just giving us a, a, a quick listen to see if the show is for you and you've been enjoying it, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button or follow button or like button or whatever the button is for your app. Uh, please do hit that and uh, check us out. And of course, a little bit more of an encouragement. Uh, Matthew and I have been answering folks' questions uh, about, hey, uh, I see there's an audio feed. Is there is there a video feed? Where can I find the video for Smart Tech Today? Well, as I mentioned, you can join us live if you want to see the video, but we need to get to 30,000 subscribers if we want to turn on the video feeds out there for you. So uh, tell your friends about the show. And, yeah, and a, a link goes a long way too. I think, especially if you're enjoying the show, definitely just tweeting it out helps a lot. 
Absolutely. And, you know, you don't even have to set up a, an automation or a shortcut or any <laughs> sort of uh, thing for that. Yeah, that's my next idea. I got to make a <laughs> share smart tech today. <laughs> uh, but you can, yeah, if you want to. And we, we hope you've enjoyed. But uh, it is time to say goodbye. So, Matthew, go ahead and say goodnight to all your smart assistants. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>